The Su-17 and Su-22 fitter are new aircraft options for Warsaw Pact and Soviet forces in Team Yankee. These are an older ground attack aircraft still in widespread service in the Team Yankee timeline. They're cheap, but are they worth it? Join me for a look at the fitter kit and let's find out. This is TSBX-28, the Su-17 fitter fighter-bomber flight box set for Team Yankee. This box was released as part of the Warsaw Pact wave for the game. It can build the Su-17 fitter for Soviets or the Su-22 export version used by East Germany, Czechoslovakia and Poland. There are two aircraft kits in the box. The kit plastic originally comes from the Academy Su-22 fitter plastic scale model aircraft kit with some added weapons, different decals and some Psyocast resin parts. I'm cheating a bit. My Su-22s come from the T-72 Tank Battalion starter box set, which contains two Su-17 fitters. I also got a couple of the Academy kits from eBay to round out my fitters to a flight of four. The Sukhoi Su-7 Fitter A was a 1950s era Soviet swept-wing supersonic fighter. It was a large, single-engine design with a characteristic nose intake common at the time. An outgrowth of the 50s faster-at-any-cost mentality, Fitter A was simple and robust, but limited internal fuel required external drop tanks to be carried. This limited the payload on the remaining pylons. The Fitter A was a low-level dogfighter, but was only produced in limited numbers. The type was retired in 1965. However, Frontal Aviation, the Soviet Tactical Air Force, requested a fighter-bomber variant designed for ground attack. Sukhoi developed the S-22 prototype, which entered service in 1961 as the Su-7B. Su-7B specialised in high-speed, low-altitude ground attack, becoming the main Soviet ground attack aircraft of the 1960s. Despite heavy and sluggish controls, Su-7B was simple to operate and maintain. Its simple design also made it rugged, a great characteristic for a ground attack aircraft. However, there were drawbacks in the design. The attack aircraft suffered from the same internal fuel issue as the fighter variant, resulting in limited payloads and short operational range. It also retained the original fighter-style cockpit designed for air-to-air -air operations, which provided only limited ground visibility. The swept wings required for supersonic flight also required long paved runways for takeoff and high landing speeds. Sukhoi tackled these issues with an updated design, the Su-17 Fitter B. The major change in the Su-17 was the outer portions of the wings had variable sweep. They were hinged inside the fixed inner wing portions and sweep angle was adjustable between 30 and 63 degrees. The straighter wing combined with leading edge slats reduced takeoff runs and lowered landing speeds. This allowed Su-17 to operate from shorter rough field runways, always desirable in a ground attack aircraft. It also improved low speed handling of the aircraft, useful for strafing and bombing attack runs. The fuselage was enlarged to increase internal fuel capacity, increasing operational range and payloads. The cockpit was raised and the nose shortened and more steeply angled to improve visibility. Su-17 retained the two 30mm cannons in the wing roots and the prominent wing fences for stability. Later variants added additional underwing and fuselage pylons for stores, eventually bringing the total to 12 hardpoints. Fitter could drop unguided munitions like general purpose bombs and rockets. It was often seen with UB-32 rocket pods, but could carry the S-13 and heavy S-24 rockets as well. The aircraft could even carry air-to-surface missiles like the AS-7 Kerry and the AS-10 Karen laser-guided munitions. These gave the fitter precision-guided attacks, including anti-tank capability. Later versions added anti-air missiles like the AA-2 Atoll and the AA-8 Aford IR-guided missiles, as well as various anti-radiation missiles to attack radars. It was also a nuclear-capable delivery platform. A special code box was installed in the cockpit to arm and release nuclear freefall bombs. Fitter was very successful and it was offered for export under the Su-20 and Su-22 designations. Warsaw Pact countries operated the type, but it also served with dozens of air forces including Vietnam, Yemen, Peru, Angola, Egypt, Libya and others. 
If we look at the back of the box, there's a top and side view of the completed kit. This appears to be a Soviet four-colour disruptive camouflage scheme. The national symbols show the fighter can be used for Soviet, Czechoslovakian, East German and Polish forces in the game. The box contains parts to build two aircraft, as well as two flight stands, a decal sheet and an assembly guide. The decals have national markings for Soviets and the three Warsaw Pact nations. Despite Battlefront's policy against including unit cards, you will find the Soviet card for the SU-17 fitter in the box. This avoids Soviet players having to buy a new card pack just for a single card. But Warsaw Pact players are out of luck. They will have to buy the new national card packs from this release to gain access to the SU-22 card. Let's look at the plastic. Each aircraft comes on two sprues of light grey plastic, plus a canopy sprue, flight stand and some resin parts. I'm going to break with review tradition and start with the resin bits. There are the resin weapons, which I was expecting. These are the S24 240mm heavy rockets. The box has eight of these, so up to four per aircraft. These are pretty simple, just a big missile moulded integral with a pylon. These are moulded in Battlefront's flexible Sciocast resin material. You'll need to glue these onto your kit with super glue. Some rockets are moulded better than others, and all of them have seam lines you'll need to clean up. It might have been nice to get some KH-25 missiles as well. This is an optional armament for the SU-17 in the game. Resin versions of the missile already come with the SU-25 Frogfoot kit. Maybe Battlefront will offer weapon upgrade packs for the fitter at some point. But the next parts are unexpected. These are replacement wheel well doors. They're designed to replace the plastic kit parts. I think Battlefront was hoping as a single piece these would be simpler to fit than the two-piece plastic parts. Unfortunately, that hasn't been my experience. Sciocast flexible resin isn't as precise to mould as plastic, and I spent ages trimming and carving these down to fit, particularly the left-hand piece. The parts were also too thick, and I had to thin them down to stop them protruding up out of the wing. Frankly, I would have used the plastic main gear doors instead, but the resin underwing weapons pylons are moulded integral with the wheel wells. Being moulded as one piece with the resin gear doors will make these stronger than the butt jointed plastic parts. As I mentioned, the plastic parts are from the Academy 144th scale SU-22 fitter kit. This was originally a Fitter J Hobbycraft kit from 1993. Given it's a three decade old kit, the parts are okay but the kit engineering is showing its age. The sprue gates are thick and there's a little bit of flash on the edges of some parts. Some sanding and careful alignment during construction will be needed. This first sprue contains the fuselage parts, air-to-air -air missiles and gear doors. The fuselage comes in left and right halves. Panel lines are engraved and there seems to be an adequate amount of detail here. You can see this is the later version of the fitter with the redesigned angled nose. As far as I can tell, this is meant to represent an SU-17 M3 Fitter H, or export SU-22 M3 Fitter J. But I'm no fitter surgeon. I could be wrong. The fuselage shape seems fine, except the dorsal spine and cockpit are maybe a bit small. These are the main gear doors. As you can see, a two-part affair. These are meant to be replaced by the battlefront resin parts. Similarly, these two nose wheel doors have resin replacements. That saves you trying to glue in and line up these two separate parts. The other parts here are various intakes and fins, as well as the interior of the nose wheel well and the cockpit instrument panel. The cockpit parts aren't required, but the wheel well is useful for stopping the resin doors pushing into the fuselage. Finally on this sprue are these two missiles. These are the AA-2 Atoll air-to-air -air missiles, heat-seeking missiles derived from an early version of the American AIM-9 Sidewinder. Feel free to mount these, but you might want to leave the pylons free for ground ordnance. This second sprue has the wings, external fuel tanks and pylons, as well as the wheels and undercarriage. The wings are moulded as single pieces in the high-speed, fully swept position. There's no possibility of posing the variable geometry wings in any other position without resorting to a saw. From my kit and other reviews, something about the way Battlefront packs kits tightly into the starter boxes seems to bend the right wing tip up. This warping isn't reflected in either of the two Academy boxed SU-22 kits I've got. You might need some hot water to bend these back straight. 
You can see the 30mm cannons in the wing route and the prominent wing fences along the wings. Underneath are the two outer wing fence pylons, usually used for the external fuel tanks. The smaller wings are the horizontal stabilizers. These fit onto the rear of the fuselage. This section has the wheels and undercarriage parts. As a gaming piece, it will be built flying and mounted on a flight stand. We won't need these. On this side are some pitot tubes for the nose. These might be a bit fragile. I haven't decided if I'll include these on my build. They just look like they'll be damaged in transit or during play. We won't need the pilot's seat as the canopy will be opaque. The onion shaped piece is the radome for inside the nose intake. This disc is marked with compressor fans but is meant to be the afterburner plate of the engine exhaust. The last section on the sprue has two external fuel tanks and the weapons pylons. The fuselage pylons are intended for the AA missiles but you could use them for rockets or bombs instead. These pylons have locating slots on the fuselage parts to aid in placement, but just butt join onto the kit. The pylons with the curved front parts glue under the wings near the wing root cannons. There are two very faint raised lines on the forward edges of the wings to place these. You won't need these if you use the resin gear doors. The fuel tanks have mounting points on them that fit the outer wing pylons moulded integral with the wings. That just leaves the canopy sprue. The battlefront kits are moulded in standard styrene. These are transparent parts on the Academy kit. Every completed kit in review I've seen mention fit issues with these parts. I used some 0.5mm styrene strip to build the canopy edges up a bit. Then you can try your luck with the front canopy portion. It wasn't perfect, but the shape is a bit better. On the next one I build, I'd actually build up the fuselage cockpit edges instead of the canopy to avoid gaps. Overall, this is an okay kit and is a fun subject and nice to have in plastic, but it was fiddly and time consuming to build. The parts count definitely shows it was designed as a scale model rather than a wargaming kit. It will take time and care to assemble. Generally, the parts are well cast, even if the canopy fit is poor. For a 30 year old design and mould, it's doing okay. You should be able to make a kit for the wargaming table out of this. Battlefront are doing their best to help by including the Sawyercast resin parts, but I spent ages trimming these. If the wheel well doors didn't anchor the pylon better, I'd probably use the plastic parts instead. Including the S24 rockets is good, but some KH-25 missiles would be nice, particularly since this is going to be a popular option on the table. You can nick some from the SU-25 Frogfoot kit if you have one. But hopefully in the future, Battlefront will let you buy some as a separate upgrade kit. 144th scale is also a popular modelling scale, so you might find some third-party weapon options available. This might be worth investigating. So how will the Su-17 fitter work on the table? Here's the unit card for the Soviet Su-17. Su-17 is an aircraft unit with the Strike Aircraft Unit special rule. Courage is 4+, morale is 3+, and skill is 5+. Skill is the important stat here. This reflects low Soviet pilot skill and training levels. The 5+, skill will make it hard to range in any rocket attacks which make an artillery or salvo attack. Fitter is hit on a 3+. Again, this reflects Soviet training. The aircraft save is a 5+. That's pretty standard for other aircraft, except for the more heavily armoured Mi-24 Hind and the Su-25 Frogfoot. This vulnerability to ground fire is something to keep in mind when deciding between Fitter and Frogfoot. The twin NR-30 30mm cannon has an 8-inch or 20cm range, with a moving rate of fire of 4, anti-tank of 7 and a 5 plus firepower. The stat line misidentifies the guns as the GSH-30-2 cannon fitted to the Su-25, but the stats are fine. The guns do have the anti-helicopter rule, so you can fire them against enemy choppers if you get the chance. The S-24 240mm rockets have a 14-inch or 35cm range, making a bombardment attack against all units caught under an artillery-sized template. Anti-tank is 7 with a 2-plus firepower. Given armoured tank teams make artillery saves against their top armour value, a heavy rocket barrage might have a chance to kill tanks. The rockets also get the brutal keyword, so infantry and unarmoured tank teams have to re-roll successful saves. The 57mm UB-32 rocket launcher fires smaller rockets, but lots of them. 
This area saturation attack covers units under a salvo template area. That's a huge area of effect. These rockets have a range of 20 inches or 50 centimetres, with anti-tank of 3 and firepower of 6. These are unlikely to kill tanks, but might give everything else a pasting. Even if you don't get kills, hits from an artillery attack can pin anti-tank guided missile teams, possibly preventing them from firing. However, the 57mm rocket salvo is a one-shot weapon. You can only use this attack once during the game. Make it count. The main problem with both the Su-17's rocket attacks is the Soviet 5 Plus skill rating. This is going to give you trouble ranging in for an artillery or salvo attack. You're unlikely to range in on the first attempt, and might not range in at all. The rocket attacks might be deadly, but they're also a bit of a risk. And that's even if your aircraft come on that turn at all. Remember that if the 57mm rocket salvo doesn't range in, you can still try again on a later turn. Until the salvo successfully fires, the one-shot rocket attack isn't expended. SU-17 do get an optional weapon that you need to pay extra points for, the KH-25 air-to-ground missile. This has a 28 inch or 70 centimetre range, but also has a minimum range of 8 inches or 20 centimetres. You can't fire the missile if you're too close. Rate of fire is only one, but it has a stonking 27 anti-tank and a 2 plus firepower. This will defeat most armour, and if it penetrates it will likely kill. The missile gets the Brutal, Guided and Heat special rules. Brutal means infantry and unarmoured tank teams must re-roll successful saves when hit by the KH-25. Guided means there's no to-hit penalty firing the missile at targets over 16 inches or 40 centimetres range. And Heat means the target doesn't get an increase in armour protection over 16 inches either. The Su-17 fitter is a support option for Soviet forces. The basic fitter airframe clocks in at just over one point each, but replacing the heavy rockets with KH-25 missiles is an additional three points per pair of aircraft. That makes fitter five points for two or eleven points for four. Still cheaper than Frogfoot, but you only get the standard five plus aircraft save. With later release waves of the game increasing armor for newer tanks, aircraft like the Su-17 and the Su-25 are useful tools in your arsenal. They do have the drawbacks of aircraft in that they're not guaranteed to come onto the table every turn. I think we've all had games where frontal aviation has chosen to stay at home. But they are useful when they do come on, and credible air threats force your opponent to spend points on air defence assets. The plastic kit does have the added complexity and parts counts of a scale model kit. Battlefront have tried to address this, but the resin parts have their own problems. This was not a smooth or easy build. However, I'm happy there's an alternative to Frogfoot, particularly for Warsaw Pact lists. And in the end, with enough work, the fitter can be a nice looking kit for the table. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed looking at the Su-17 and Su-22 fitter fighter bomber flight for Team Yankee. Do you plan to add these to your force? Will you use the low cost option and hope Eastern Bloc training holds up for the bombardments, or will it be KH-25 missiles all the way? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching. See you next time.